Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. And with us today, we have David Brown. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you tell the audience a little bit about who you are, what you do? I can indeed, yeah. Um, My name is uh, the same as my father's name. He was also a David Brown. And um, uh, I started off my working life by uh, working in a family firm building uh, earth moving equipment. So we built very big uh, off highway dump trucks. Uh, My father's name and my name, very similar to a man also called David Brown, who started Aston Martin, but no relation whatsoever. (laughs) Um, At one stage, uh, well, he and my father, the David Brown from Aston Martin, and my father, the David Brown from from me, uh, they were actually good friends. And uh, in fact, they both at one stage were building tractors, competitive tractors. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I started my uh, working life off in... uh, very heavy engineering business, uh, building off-highway articulated dump trucks, which are a uh, massive thing, really. The biggest one hmm. we made weighed, when it was fully laden, about 100 tonnes. Um, <laughs> and uh, so some, some big pieces of kit, really. Th- those businesses did extremely well. And um, we were always, we always felt we were inventing a product to solve a problem the customer didn't know he had. So in other words, these, this was a, a new way of doing things with a new piece of equipment. Mm-hmm. And um, in that regard, it was, uh, uh, we, we, people shifted dirt, so muck shifters. They had ways of doing it that had been around for almost ever since the horse and cart. And mm-hmm. we, we developed a product that allowed them to do it a different way. That product is now uh, used throughout the world. There's tens of thousands of them now having been built and used throughout the world to do a job uh, in a very efficient way. Having started that company with my father, um, I then um, uh, I sold the company to Caterpillar um, and uh, started quite a few other different businesses as a consequence. And they were almost lifestyle businesses. Yeah. Um, and those businesses, uh, I had some uh, clothes shops, uh, some lady shoe shops, uh, some restaurants, bars, um, house building company. So I started all these other businesses almost immediately after selling that company. That put me into the lifestyle section of, of life, uh, something yeah. I hadn't really been in before. And... Um, so when it came to starting David Brown Automotive, I had two sets of uh, experiences and skills that when blended together, uh, ended up with the products that we now have. So mm. first of all, manufacturing, making something was not something that worried me in the slightest. So people today will still say, you know, how on earth do you go about making a car? And I have to think of it from their perspective. And their perspective is, we don't, you know, we've no idea how to go about making a car. I do. Yeah. Um, and the other side, which was the lifestyle businesses, which was all about style, taste, um, and um, the fashion side of business, um, which were then able to blend together to produce the cars we do today. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a, a nice mix. And had you always had a passion for cars throughout this time? Yeah. Um, when I was younger, like everyone who likes cars when they're younger, I would uh, customise a car to a certain extent. And in those days, you know, the first thing you did when you bought any car was to uh, go on a proper radio for it and big speakers and hide some yeah. amplifiers. But I had one of the first Range Rovers, which was a, a hammer down from a father. And I remember uh, turbocharging that before cars were really turbocharged, um, <laughs> customizing the interior, um, adding an extra gearbox to it. So it had 16 forward speeds, and um, uh, which if you were ever wanted to impress someone, you'd run through each gear on the way up the gearbox. Yeah. 
only took about a quarter of an hour to get the top. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, always interested in cars. And um, at various stages, I built my own rally car. So uh, I, I, I loved rally driving, but I got into that quite late on. But then built the cars that I rallied um, with, mm. with help. Um, so uh, I won the Group N Championship in a Subaru. And um, oh, awesome. and then um, built a world rally car based on Ford Escort parts, but a, a Ford Puma shell because I just thought it looked better. And um, and rallied that successfully as well. So um, interested in cars, still interested in all sorts of cars. Um, I have a an old AC nineteen thirty seven, um, which um, I've used on some endurance rallies relatively recently. So I've done the Peking to Paris rally, for example. Oh, wow. What is that like? Because that sounds amazing. Okay. So I did that in a 1927 Rolls-Royce Phantom II that belonged to a friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, in, at the start of it in Peking or Beijing, um, we would have won the prize for the most unsuitable car on a rally without a shadow of a doubt. When... Five, six, however many weeks later it was, and we drove down the Champs Elysees into the centre of Paris. We should have won a prize for the most successful crossing of uh, a continent ever. Mm. It broke down every single solitary day, and <laughs> there wasn't anything that didn't go wrong on it. And um, and every day you just end up underneath the car uh, at the end of the day, absolutely filthy, tired out and um, trying to fix something yet again on it, to put it right. Mm. Um, but as an experience, um, it was fantastic. Um, you know, you go to some places that you will never, ever go back to, no reason to go back to them. And yeah. um, similarly, in, in my AC, I've done the uh, Singapore up through Malaysia, Thailand, and into Burma up oh, into wow. Malibu, and then across South America as well. Uh, Argentina, Chile, and Peru. They're fantastic. You know, they're, I, I love, fortunately, driving. And yeah. um, so every day, every time you're out driving, you're still practicing a skill. You know, you're still, you would even, you try and take the racing line through a forest, um, <laughs> you know, at 100 miles an hour, trees either side. You're desperate to try and find that line all the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I enjoy driving. <laughs> That's uh, those those trips. I mean, they sound absolutely amazing. And doing it in something old must add a lot to the experience versus doing it, you know, like a modern Range Rover. Oh, it massively does. And you know, one of the reasons I enjoy driving my AC is that you really do feel every little thing. You know, you smell the smell from the outside. Um, driving from, uh, when I got to Paris, on the Peking to Paris rally, I didn't want to get a plane home. So I got a lift back from Paris with one of the mechanics in his van uh, yeah. to, I think it was Oxford Services, where I got someone to pick me up, and pick me up in my Range Rover. And I got into the Range Rover, and I love my Range Rover. It's a fantastic car. But I got into it, and... I didn't like it because it was too refined. You know, it was too, everything about it was like a sofa on wheels. And having spent, yeah. traveled all that distance, literally smelling, you know, the roses you drove past somewhere or the dead dog in the ditch, um, <laughs> whatever it was, um, you were in touch with it. And in touch through the steering wheel and touch through literally the smells I can remember so very, very much. And, um, and we used to refer to the AC as the comfort capsule because it's a tiny little car. You get into this thing and you're, you're like that. I've done thousands and thousands of miles in it across all sorts of different terrain. Fantastic. Mm. That is, it sounds like the best. And absolutely, like that, that point you said about the smells, like I kind of forget about that now But because I don't drive cars without the roof on very often or I don't, and I don't have a convertible. But... Every now and then I'll borrow something or drive something, whether it's a caterham or something like that. And you do, like you drive down a country lane and it's just like, it just hits you like, 
leaves and forest and all that stuff. And it just adds so much. No, it really does. It really does. It adds to the sensation of where you are. It's excellent. Mm. The and, and driving through all of those countries, like, did you end up in some pretty like sticky situations at any point, or was it relatively okay? No, I think that um, I I can't remember a single place where I felt uncomfortable. Um, mm. And um, I remember crossing from Mongolia into Russia, and there's a region called the Altai region in which borders. It's like the bottom end of Siberia, touches Mongolia. And that was one of the most stunning places I've been to. And the local car clubs, um, they all came out to meet us and greet us. Oh, and if you yeah. needed anything doing, there was somebody there, and I can't remember what car it was now, um, but they, the engine needed to come out. And uh, the sooner they got in the car park, then all the locals were underneath it. They had the engine lifted out of it on a piece <laughs> of wood and some chains within about... Uh, literally 10 minutes you know it was out and um so everywhere people love to see um old cars and they're fascinated by it you know and, and in certain areas you know bits of china they wouldn't thank you for an old car you know they, they, they've gone through 50 60 70 years of old cars all they want now is a toyota land cruiser yeah <laughs> and um so yeah that's you know it's um different people a different view on uh what life should be yeah i'd not thought about the local car clubs in those situations because i i'd sort of thought that it would just be you'd start at one end and you'd drive to the other end and you would deal with all the stuff in the middle but obviously there's loads of enthusiasts in the middle who want to come and meet these people doing this trip and um and see what's going on and check out the cars and stuff would you be traveling with other like are you traveling with other cars or are you generally by yourself how does that work um you are traveling i mean there's uh peaking to paris rally now probably got mm. 120 maybe even more uh participants 120 cars um so you set off at different intervals and you always have a hotel or some accommodation or a tent that you're in for at night time. So you always try and get to the same place. But inevitably, you if you have a breakdown, we had a breakdown. I can't remember what the breakdown was now. We had quite a few uh, on the peaking to Paris. And um, that meant we were a day behind. So we, I remember one night just sleeping outside in the Mongolian uh, desert and be walking by an inquisitive camel first thing in the morning. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it was, there, there, there's some brilliant, brilliant memories. Yeah. Oh, it sounds, sounds super cool. So where did the idea for a, well, the, I guess the first car, was the first car the, the Speedback? That was the first car, right? It was, yeah. And where did the idea for that come from? And sort of, so how did you end up with that design and everything. I had a, a, a DB5, Aston Martin DB5. And um, long before I considered making my own car. And like a lot of old cars, particularly some of the cars in the 60s, they, they were extremely unreliable. And, um, right. and so whenever I used this car, it was with trepidation. And most times it broke down. And, yeah. you know, big things like the topos bursting and little things like, you know, a wire came off and the windscreen wiper stopped working, whatever it was. Yeah. So always in my mind, I was going to do something with this DB5. I was actually going to um, put a, uh, an American crate engine in and do all the electronics differently. But everyone said to me, if you do that, you will ruin the value of it. And this was <laughs> before they got silly. But um, yeah. So I was talked out of that. Um, at the same time, I was on a, another classic car, more of a tour in the, uh, in the south of France, and a friend had loaned me a Ferrari, uh, oh, what was the thing? It's like a, a, a convertible. It will come to me what the name of it was. Um, anyway, this thing, you forgot how absolutely 
awful some of the cars were in that period. <laughs> Again, a 1960s car. So yeah. the steering was heavy. The gearbox was awful. Anyway, mercifully, it jammed itself into second gear, and I couldn't get it out of second gear. <laughs> and so I had to abandon it. And um, I abandoned it uh, near Nice Airport and got a little Peugeot 205 as a, uh, as a hire car to continue with the rest of the rally. And you jump out of something like that, um, like that fabulous Ferrari that everyone thinks is yeah. absolutely brilliant, into you know a cheap little hire car, and you realise how good cars have become in that period. Yeah. So it had air conditioning, it had power steering, it had a radio and things like that. And um, so people on the rally, pretend, and it was red hot, so people on the rally pretended they felt sorry for me. And so if you want to, you can drive our car as long as we can drive that thing over there with air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so the reality was that, um, you know, the, the cars had moved on an enormous amount. I then got, the, and there's all sorts of factors, but I then saw some really interesting bits of engineering uh, going on in just in all, all sorts of walks of life. And you could see how with uh, new digital technology, you could make things beautifully and accurately and repeatable. Um, so you could make low volume parts that previously somebody had to carve by hand with a file to create the shape. So that's sort of thing. Oh, maybe we should make, maybe make a car that is reminiscent of the 60s, um, but is actually uh, full of uh, current and modern technology to give you that the pleasure that you would normally get from just driving a car in that way. So yeah. that's how I started. And initially, I was just going to make the car for myself. Um, but um, everybody said, it looks really, really nice. You should think about putting it into production. So that's what happened. And that, and that bit there, okay, in that sort of the gap between you're going to make a car for yourself and it going into production, did you did you look at a bunch of different platforms as a as a base? Did you did you just go okay? I'm going to start with something that someone else has done, and then coach build my own bodywork onto it, or and like how how did that process? Did you look at a few different options and stuff like that? Well, I think the thing the, the thing was that you know predominantly it had to be British in in its content. Um, yeah. to make sense of what the brand stood for and still stands for. And, and British as well, just because I'm a proud Brit and uh, yeah. wanted it to um, uh, reflect what was happening in the UK. And in, so there's then very few platforms that are actually available. Um, if you go back to the early days of car production, you would have people like Rolls-Royce and Bentley um, and all they would build is a rolling chassis. Somebody else would put the bodywork on. Somebody else yeah. would trim it and do everything else. So in some respects, wanted to get back to that sort of feel. Um, and then that narrows massively the, um, uh, the choices you've got. Um, but one kept standing out for a whole host of reasons, and that was the, uh, the, some of the Jaguar platform, largely because they're bonded aluminium uh, sections, structures together, um, and we were going to make an aluminium body that we would bond to that. Um, okay. The V8 engine that's in the Speedback uh, supercharged engine is, I think, one of the best V8 engines in the world. Absolutely ideal for a GT. Lots of low down torque, um, but the you know discretionary performance um, in terms of how you choose to use it. So the decision became relatively easy. Yeah. And then, and then, so what's the process then you've, you've got a, a base car, which was, is it an XKR? Is that right? XKR. Yeah. And then, and, and then what did you, did you design the body? Did you get someone else? How, how did you, okay. what was your, what were you looking for? So we were looking to take styling cues for the car from the sixties. So all of the world's greatest, still most attractive supercars came from that period of time. And, you know, you think about the 60s in terms of 
what they actually were. It was a you had the the um, the problems of the fifties um, where money was tight, food was tight, you know, rationing was still on. Everything was um, was still recovering from the from the World War World War Two. Um, then in the sixties, everything started to um, uh, relax and become more available. Music, uh, you know, just went off at a tangent. Um, so did sex, so did art, so did all of the things that had been constrained by by the austerity of the uh, of the post war years. Um, so the sixties produced these big curvy machines, um, and most of them were styled in studios in uh, in in Italy. Um, you know, it was a, a relatively small handful of people that um, styled cars, including some of the British cars, the exception of the E-Type. You know, they were all, yeah. all styled over there. And um, so for us to get into, we, we wanted to recreate that period of time. Uh, yeah. But we didn't want a pastiche of a number of different things. We wanted the thing to sit in its own right. So the process was to um, uh, do a full-size clay model of what the car would look like. And basically we did the model in two different, two halves. So slight changes on one side to the other. And when we decided which of the two halves we liked the best, um, we uh, digitized that down the middle and flipped it across and you've got a mirror image of, of what you like. But even that, you know, to, to create that, I made it sound easy. It's not, you know, the skill <laughs> involved in uh, making the clay model are fantastic. And I had a go once and messed it up. And um, uh, but I knew what I wanted. I knew the sort of look I wanted. And then you've got, you know, you've got to take account of all the packaging issues. You've got how things are actually going to fit in real life. Um, I wanted a very usable car. If it's a GT, it's a Grand Tourer. If it's a Grand Tourer, it means you go on a journey. If you go on a journey, you take luggage. And yeah. uh, there's so many GTs today that are not. <laughs> you know, you cannot. Most, most I would say. <laughs> yeah, you cannot get anything in them. So it becomes a, you know, something that if you want to take the wife away for the weekend. Um, you almost can't because you can't get the luggage in that you need. So it becomes. So to me, those cars were pointless. So it had to be practical. And um, so the Speedback GT is very much that. It's very much a practical uh, piece of kit that you could use in all sorts of different ways. Um, so once you've got the clay model looking the way you want it, um, digitize it, and then the, the hammer forms, which are the, the wooden... Uh, insides, if you like, of the aluminium body, they are produced using five-axis CNC milling machines from the data that you've got when you've scanned the car. Yeah. So to then make the body shell, you then use some really traditional skills, which is the old English wheel. So people there are rolling this material and forming the shape and then putting it onto the hammer form to make sure it is exactly the right shape. And um, and that's basically and simply how we make the um, uh, make the shell. Um, now it sounds as if it's something you can just then just drop on the top of uh, <laughs> and a few bolts and you're off, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, so it's still a great a, a massive amount of work. We have things like uh, soft close on the doors. Um, yeah. and we have to incorporate that both in both mechanically into the system and electronically into the systems that we use. So we tried not to reinvent any wheels that uh, were already there and use existing either technology or components to get us there. Um, but at the same time, in terms of style and in terms of content, um, we wanted to create our own things, our own uh, uh our own DNA, if you like, in terms of yeah. what the product looked like. Yeah, it's I, and it's when you see it, like uh, I'll put up some images for the people watching the video and the people who are not Google it. The um, the Speedback GT, it, it it's a cool looking thing. It, it looks 
like you said, it looks kind of like something from a bygone era in terms of the design styling. Um, and then, but you've still got reasonably modern. Well, when when did the, the car, when did you launch the car? Uh, eight years ago now. Yeah. So you get in it and you've got, well, I don't know the stuff has been upgraded now so you can have car play and stuff like that but you've got all your sort of creature comforts but then um i didn't realize i didn't realize this was the case i'd seen the picture of the car from the outside but when i went and had a look around um it's got like a little tailgate that comes down at the back that, that if you've not seen a picture it won't make sense but when you look at it and then it's got a massive boot like it's huge which act makes a hundred percent sense in the it's a gt car therefore you need to be able to put luggage in it and then you've got i don't is this on all cars are the seats on the fold out seats on all the cars yeah so the 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 rear tailgate there is a, a tailgate and then the sloping roof and the rear tailgate will fall flat and line up with the floor of the boot um similarly with the rear seats you don't have to have seats but if you've got seats or little parcel shelves that we've got in, in some of the cars, mm. that will fall forward and flat as well. So you've got this massive flat forward, flat floored boot extending all the way. But then we had some space and we thought we can do something clever. So we we developed a little dicky seat that will fold out of there. So um, if you want to, if you're in the right place, um, you can lift that seat up and perch yourself on the back. And there's a lot of car companies doing that now. Uh, but I think we were first. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, when it when it got unfolded in front of me, I was just like, I did not expect that, and that is it's really cool. It's basically, yeah, a seat, a double seat facing backwards, sitting kind of on the tailgate that folds out from the boot, um, and yeah, you see it in some some other cars now, but it's quite a neat thing. And then I know you you can you can customize all this stuff a lot, can't you? You can. Yeah, we 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 custom we encourage people to be individual in terms of what they do. So yeah. we want people to enjoy the process of specking the car up and to realise that they can really make it um, a reflection of their own personality. So we've got you know we. The answer is yes. Now, what's the question in terms of uh, what we can do and the way we'll do it? And uh, we've we've thoroughly enjoyed uh, helping people create these individual uh, reflections of them. What what have been some of the sort of most interesting modifications or adjustments you've made to a car for a a unique customer or something? Well, the... (laughs) We've, we've built a number of them. Uh, the one actually borrowed it from the customer and took it to a show uh, at the weekend. And um, it was a pearlescent white car um, with a green leather interior. And instead of the veneers, instead of the panels on the dash and on the door cards being uh, veneered with, with uh, uh, a high gloss finish, they were actually painted body cut. Um, and uh, it, when he first said that that's what I wanted, it was like, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like, but it yeah. looks fantastic. And out yeah. in the sunshine, uh, you know, that paint just sparkles. It's absolutely beautiful. So it was one of the stars of the show the other day when we took it there. It was absolutely beautiful. And then have you done any, because you can have on the top, is it on the top of, Basically, the fold, the fold-out seat folds into the boot, and then you can have other stuff sort of on it on that area, don't you? Because I think there was like a the one I saw the other day had sort of space for your whiskey and your glasses and all that sort of stuff. Have you had any funny requests there? Like I don't know, gun no, lockers and whatever. Not really, we've we've had all sorts of people's make suggestions as to what could go in there and um but the reality is most people want something along the lines of uh, i think one we just done had a bottle of johnny walker whiskey in there and some glasses down the side yeah um but it's um it's just it it the speed back is a conservative type of thing 
It's mm. not something that um, it's not a flash car. It's a it's a stunning car mm. and looks great. Um, but it's not flash in the sense of it being, you know, highly aggressive uh, in terms of its selling. When we drive that car around, most of the time, we just get people doing that because as you drive past, because they just think it looks great. Yeah. Never, never ever had a negative reaction to it, which I know you would get in some contemporary supercars. Um, yeah. And that tends to reflect itself in the type of person the owners are. Um, they um, they want something special, but they don't want something, and I use the word for lack of a better one, they don't want something flash or uh, yeah. in your face. Yeah, I totally get that. And the sort of, I would say the ethos of the car that I've sort of picked up by, by driving it is it's a GT car that has been set up to be comfy and the suspension is comfy and it, on a British B road, it is comfy. You're not having your t teeth like rattled out and it just kind of, you kind of just kind of cruise around with this nice V8 sound and get to your location and it fit, it, it has a sort of, it's not a vintage experience, but there's vintage elements brought into the experience. Like you've got the wood, this one had a wooden steering wheel and stuff like that, which just sort of take you back to a slightly different era while still remaining in a, in a modern car. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed driving it, but it was, and it was very re like relaxing and I, I very much enjoyed that part of it. It set out to be what it is. So it mm. is, a certain terms of style and different people see different things in it, depending on your frame of reference. So Americans see a muscle car element to the back end. Germans, people have seen uh, throwbacks to some Porsches at the front. Italians, uh, 250 short wheelbase Ferraris. British, Aston Martin. Um, but it, in its own right, it stands as a complete thing. Um, mm. Not as a prestige of all those things put together, but it sets out to be a genuine, ge a genuine GT, and um, and that was really, really important in terms of the original uh, design and styling. Yeah, I think, and I think that's something that is is absolutely missing in a lot of modern cars. That actually being a GT car, like it, it actually being comfy, that everything seems to be compromised around a lap time nowadays, which doesn't really make sense for a lot of cars. It doesn't. My daily runaround is an Audi RS3, and mm. it has tyres that are side <laughs> that thick. Yeah. So if I hit a pothole, it will either uh, puncture the tyre or smash the wheel, which is done on a number of occasions. Yeah. The re I wanted to put smaller wheels on it so I could get a deeper uh, sidewall, a, a higher sidewall. Um, you can't because it's got the front brakes are so big they'd stop a Le Mans car uh, going down. Yeah. The <laughs> brake. They'd stop it, and it is totally yeah. un. The rest of the car is fantastic, but it's unnecessary. And uh, yeah. uh, you know that everybody is focused on something it's either a ridiculous horsepower number or it's uh, desperate to break the 300 mile an hour top speed where when how um yeah. and um you know the the a few years ago i drove the speed back down to uh show in the south of france and uh i kept getting passed by the same three ferraris I thought, I don't <laughs> understand how they're passing me. And then I pulled into a service station at the same time they did. And the reason they were passing me is that when they, passed, when they got out of the car, it was like, oh, ouch. And uh, <laughs> they could only do about 70 miles before they had to get out and have a chiropractor yeah. back, back in place. <laughs> and, um, and I get it. You know, I, I am massively uh, full of admiration for the technology and um, and a lot of the styling, but it sometimes beggars belief when when this can actually be used or how it's going to be used. Yeah, and um, I'm not a big track day fan, uh, largely because 
I, I did what I needed to do like that in rally cars in forests. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to go and aim for a blade of grass, aim for another blade of grass and believe that I've got the racing line just spot on like that. So our yeah. cars are not track bed cars or the speed backs aren't. No. <laughs> no. No. That you've picked the purpose and the aim is to fulfill that purpose. Nothing else really. Um, so you, the car got a... A bit of a bit of an update, not necessarily an update, a styling change um, with the is it the Silverstone edition? It is, yeah. Um, can you explain to people what that is? Yeah, so um, we wanted to create two different versions, almost of the same thing, and um, so the Silver Silverstone edition is Aurora. Um, doesn't have the little bumperettes on it. Has um, it has a different finish to the chrome work? It's got an engine uh, performance enhancement. It has different suspension fitted. So it's supposed to, it's supposed to be and is a raw version, of, but a slightly faster version of the same of the same car. Mm. Um, and different people, you know, I'm delighted. To, some people like one, some people like the other, and uh, or prefer one to the other. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was um, it was intended to, I think, a slightly younger audience as well. It was we were aiming for, but still, people wanted that same overall GT feel. Yeah. Uh, when I look at the two cars, so there was, a, I think, your car was there, which is a Silverstone edition, and. Um, that to me is a more appealing image. Like it's 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 just sort of smoothed out in various places, cleaned up in different ways, and like you said, the bright work is different and a different finish. It's more of a, like a brushed, um, sort of brushed stainless kind of brush finish rather than a, a shiny kind of finish. And it it appeals much more to me. It's amazing actually how different the two cars look next to each other. Um, but yeah, I I I thought it looked really cool. Um, that with the changes, and then I guess I'm a younger person, so that's possibly well. Some you know, people have said that the, the Speedback BT is for a gentleman, and the uh Silverstone edition is for someone who is not yet ready to become a gentleman. <laughs> and fair uh, enough, and I think they were talking about me there, so uh, I'm happy, <laughs> <with that. laughs> yeah. So at some point in time, you started doing doing minis. Yeah. Um, what? Why? Why minis? And yeah, what was the goal with that? Okay. So the original intention, uh, we wanted to put something else. Wanted. We had all these skills we were developing, and uh, some great people as well in the business. Um, we wanted to put some more volume through the business. As simple as that. And. Um, the, uh, the the mini was something that you can't see, but I've got two photographs on my on my wall here, my two heroes. Top one is Roger Daltrey, singer from The Who, and the bottom one is my father. And uh, my father always described the mini to me, uh, my first car was a mini, as one of the best engineered cars ever in the world but one of the most appallingly manufactured at the same time. <laughs> and um, so when we were looking at what sort of things, what sort of British cars we could do, uh, we, we could, um, we looked at a number and the Mini just kept jumping out as the almost the obvious one to do. We didn't know what the reaction was going to be to the Mini Remaster. And I remember the day that we launched it um, to, uh, to various press and uh, in other interested parties. And it was, most people's reaction was something along the lines of, why has no one done this before? And, <laughs> um, and that's a great reaction to end up getting because you just think, yeah. <laughs> um, because they haven't. <laughs> Yeah. And um, so in that regard, it was uh, it was almost an obvious choice to do. 
and and the process for the mini, I guess, was a it was a very different process for the um, the speedback. Like, how did you attack that project? So the the essence behind Mini Remastered is that um, it is fundamentally a restored car. So it's a restoration of an existing car, and we do a superb job of doing that. So it, it is not a new car uh, in the same way that a speedback will be classified as a new car. They are always a restored, a restored car. So we buy a donor car, and from that donor car, we, um, uh, we will remanufacture the engine. So the engine is completely rebuilt. Um, it ends up being a miles better engine than it was. Um, I don't you know. You actually look too young to remember that BMW, when they used to build Formula One engines, they would take a, a three-liter engine block out of a car that had done 150,000 miles because right. that was stress relieved. You know, if, if, as long as it hadn't fallen to pieces, that was the that was miles better than a brand new block. And I think yes. in some ways, what we do with Mini Remaster and, and restoring the engine, rebuilding the engines, is the same thing. Um, and then we take some components we we simply have to change. We have to put new components. Others, uh, you know, parts of suspension, things that... So there'd, there'd, be, there'd be various bracketry, for example, um, that we will take off the donor cards. We will blast it. It almost shot peens the surface. And it, uh, have you ever owned a Mini? No. Okay. Well, I have. So um, my first Mini, SBB240M, um, that, uh, that was that beautiful orange British Leyland colour. It was vile. But the good thing about the orange colour is the same colour as the rust that the car arrived with. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. So uh, it disguised it for quite some time. But um, when, you, um, when you take some of these components, uh, the existing original components from the, from the donor car, and you, um, you shot blast them, and the shot glass blasting it, it actually hardens the surface of the metal, the action of doing that. And then, of course, um, we powder coat them. And um, so um, you end up with a mark. It's still the same thing that came off the donor car, but it looks brand new. And yeah. it is not going to rust like the, uh, like the original car would. So um, we will nearly always use a new body shell uh, because a new body shell is quite simply the most cost-effective way of getting to the finish that we want to get to. Um, we've got thousands of hours of work in each one, and a lot of that work is in the uh, making sure that, you know, you would regularly buy a Mini um, where when you close the door, the door frame hit, hit the side of the car as it was closing, that, just the way they were. And we will address yeah. all that. We'll get great shut lines. We'll get nice flowing curves where there should be a nice flowing curve. And there's just an enormous amount of work to go from what, you know, people say, well, I can restore uh, a Mini. And, yeah, they can, you can do it. Everyone can restore the Mini themselves at home. Um, but we do it in a in a, a more production arguably more professional way to get the ultimately the finish of the thing at the end of the process yeah i was actually we so i drove the ocelli edition which is yeah. more of a sort of track orientated i guess or just it's got a cage in the back and and whatnot and a bit more horsepower for for the listeners but uh, one thing i was amazed we were driving down the the motorway for a little bit coming back to sort of base and there was basically no wind noise or, or very minimal wind noise. I was expecting to be able to hear coming from the outside, like through the windows and stuff. And then I started looking around. And then when we got to the uh, back to base, I had a look and you know opened and shut the doors and whatever. And yeah, in short, like I was very impressed with, like you said, all, all of the seals and the way the doors work and fit mean that the outside does not come in when you're driving. But yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, that 
detail like that just does not happen by accident. And um, so the you know the there is a as I said there's a massive amount of work to make it like that to make the door shut easily. You know you're still t- things like the door seals, which people you know no one wants to talk about a door seal. I'm going to you know a contemporary door seal is made in a completely different way. The mini door seal um, it wouldn't have been you know that they started fitting them. Uh, shortly after they were invented. <laughs> yeah. But prior to that, it was sort of felt. There wasn't a door sale. So you're still working with some old technology there, but you can still make it nice and you can make it work. And, um, you know, the problem with the original minis was the way in which they were manufactured, not the way in which they were designed or engineered yeah. in the first instance. So, you know, the, the seams on the outside of the car, which some people like and I don't mind them, um, but they were put there um, because it was the cheapest way of manufacturing, not because the designer originally intended them to be there. Yeah, it was very interesting at the at the factory to wander around because there was a, a donor car waiting to be you know converted. Yeah, and you could see it, and it had all these seams and stuff, which I I don't even because I, I I've not owned a mini. And I've not spent too much time around them. I've almost never really noticed the seams. Yeah. And then, like, the massive seams all over the place. And then right next to it was a car that it was undergoing the first bit of the production and it had its new body on it and everything. And you're like, oh, my God, this looks so much better. It looks so different, like, straight away. Yeah, and I think it's just, you know, it's part of what we set out to do with with a car in total. So, you know, we, we put a new dashboard in there, which has got, as you now know, which has got a sat-nav unit in there. It's got air con sat in there as well. And um, all those things uh, help to make it look almost as if it is a, a brand new car. And certainly you only really see the difference. And it's a massive difference, when, as you've just experienced, when you've got the two sat side by side and uh, you see what was actually in them in the first place but you know again the, the the mini story i love as well so there's a car developed in mid to late 50s and designed as a very cheap four-seater family car for everyone to use and then in the 60s comes along and all the things we talked about earlier apply massively to the mini at that period of time um mm. so it, it very often um Women started to drive. Women hadn't driven that much before. And as they started to drive, the Mini was, you know, the absolute brilliant first car for them. Um, and then the eldest child nearly always uh, got the the uh, the mother's car handed down to them. So it became the first yeah. car in that sense for a lot of people. But it also became a fun car. You know, you see the pictures of the Mini in the time, the 60s, in Carnaby Street with the Beatles driving it, and everybody, you know, it was a, it was an inoffensive thing in that regard. Um, mm. Not just inoffensive, it was fun. And fun is what people wanted. And we've, we've tried to put that back in as well into, into the product. Um, and um, so, yeah, the 60s drove... Uh, the Mini into a completely different category that it was ever intended to be in the first place. And had the designers known, in, had Izzy Gonis' team known that that was going to happen, they might have done it differently. Um, yeah. They didn't. You know, they thought it was going to, they thought, and to a very large extent it was, a competitor to um, a brilliantly manufactured vehicle, which was the VW Beetle. But an awful bloody thing, and the engine's in the wrong place. <laughs> it's uh, uh, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's your point about the dash is, I guess actually, because the dash must have uh, the car I saw that was coming in for build. I think was quite an old one or an older one, um, and the dash and set up inside just looked pretty much prehistoric. Um, whereas when you get in one of your cars, it all like, like you said, it's all just like looks kind of like. Not not modern, but just nice. Well, thank you. I'm really proud of that dash. It was a young designer that worked for us um, who came up with all of that detail. And I think 
we did an excellent job with that, you know, in terms of when you look at it, you look at the dash within the car as part of the car, it looks as if it's always been there. You know, it doesn't look yeah. like some uh, sticky on bit. It looks like it was designed as the original design. So when you see, you know, the, the lovely leather work on it and the features that it's got within it, the way it ties in colour-wise with the exterior of the car, um, I think it looks superb. I am really proud of that. Yeah, I thought it was very cool. In fact, and, I, and I hadn't looked in like an old Mini for a long time, so I just looked in yours and was like, yeah, that's what it looks like. And then I saw this other one in the workshop and was like, oh, no, that's what it looks like before. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. This is different. What... Um, were there some of the bits, what was the, were there some of the sort of unexpected challenges with doing the Mini that you didn't really expect to run into? And to... There's lots of unexpected challenges in everything in life. So um, yeah. the uh, the fact that the Mini has had its its fair share, I'm just trying to think of something that um, will illustrate the point. I think that um, there were lots of, components that you thought you might be able to buy off the shelf that we can't that we have to have manufactured especially for us and that was a bit of a surprise um the um no i think that as we when we first when we built the first ones we put slightly different suspension components in so they the um the molten design rubber bush that's the uh, suspension unit um, there were about 25 different variants of that in terms of the mix during the life of the Mini. So, yeah. we, And then there were people that did motorsport versions because Minis, and the one thing I forgot to mention about the 60s, is that they also discovered it was a great rally car. So it was everything car. Um, yeah. so there's lots of motorsport-related um, components out there. And if you put those into the Mini you create something a lot harsher and harder than we than we were trying to uh, uh, create. So um, with the um, Ocelli edition that you drove, um, that is deliberately a harder car um, in terms of its drive, but equally it's still not um, as hard as you could make it because most of the time people are going to drive it on the road. And um, yeah. you could, you know, you could turn it into a go kart and give it go kart like handling, but that's not going to uh, be that comfortable when you're driving it normally. So, um, I think the the other thing that uh, surprised me about the about the mini itself is how many different markets it got sold into. You know, absolutely okay, yeah. all over the world. So everybody and it is. Again, it's like a, a mini speed back in terms of uh, the reaction you get from people because they love it. And, um, you know, it's a, again, it's an inoffensive thing to own. It doesn't have, it doesn't contradict um, the sort of person that might normally be driving it. Yeah, absolutely. It was something I was talking to one of the team about. Um, we had, there's certain cars that, uh, that you get a, you know a certain associated image but there's also certain cars that just sort of fly through all of that and there is no image of the person and um one of the ones a new car that i'd say is a bit like that is like a smart car smart for two you know the, the little that could be driven by anyone and everyone i don't think people some people the owners love them but i don't think you look at someone in a smart car and you don't necessarily go oh, they can't afford another car or this is their only car or whatever. It's just they've chosen that car for a reason. And it's like sort of similar sort of thing. Like you see someone driving a Mini and it could be their only car or it could be their hundredth car. Like it fits into all categories of kind of cool. And, and that's one of the things that, that helped it in the 60s. So this, in the 60s, it was owned by the rich and famous, you know, and it was a cool little car. And today it's, um, and then it went through a phase of, you know, where lots of things came out and stole its thunder. But today, you, you know, you drive that car anywhere and you just get, uh, no one thinks, well, they can't afford anything else. Even if it's 
not one of our minis, even if it's, you know, a, a, an old knackered thing that someone yeah. is just holding together with gaffer tape and string. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so the car I drove, which was the Ocelli edition, that's, that's a little bit different to the, the normal Mini Remastered. What was the sort of inspiration behind that and what did you do to it? The, it that was to build on the Mini's sporting heritage. Um, a seller themselves were noted engine tuners from the 60s, you know, been around doing and racing Minis and tuning engines for Minis all that time. Um, the Mini... Um, as I think nearly everyone knows, has a, a great sporting heritage and it is still today used um, you know, on racetracks all over the world because it's a great little car. Um, and so we wanted to give an additional uh, uh, string to our bow in terms of uh, one more variant of the already popular Mini Remastered. So it, it, as I said earlier, it sat on slightly harder suspension. It's got a much more powerful engine. Um, it's also carburetted, and uh, as opposed to uh, uh, fuel injected, and that brings with it its, uh, you know, its own character, and um, yeah. uh, and a lovely character as well. You know, I like carburetted cars, uh, and so the sound that the that goes with the performance is excellent. Yeah, it's a fun, like within, it's one of those cars you get in and within like 100 metres, you're like, oh, this, is, this is probably going to be quite amusing. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this process. So many people um, uh, have taught their children to drive on minis, including our Mini Remastered, because they believe that they're actually being taught to drive. And um, so there's no traction control. Um, there is a predictable element of how it's going to handle without any electronics stepping in to save the day. Um, mm -hmm. If you can drive it, and it is easy to drive, um, you know, as long as that steering wheel is pointing in the direction you intend to go, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but you've got nothing to sort it out other than those wheels saying, we've got this way. Yeah, it's a very pointy and sort of squirty little thing and it just kind of you you're immediately aware when you're driving that car how small it is relative to other traffic and how much even just like how much space you have on the road because it's not that wide it's like it is small it is you i mean again um you look at some of today's current minis and I'm not just referring to the BMW Minis, I'm referring to you know, the Fiat 500 and anything in that mm. that that claims to be a Mini isn't anymore. <laughs> um, no. And that's partly legislation that makes it go that way and partly um, the creature comforts that people demand out of uh, a normal car. This is actually something I was talking to um, I, I believe he's a, an acquaintance of yours, Ian Briggs, from BAC. Um, I was chatting to him yes, to, on Tuesday. And we were talking about the small city car and how none of the small, specifically the Mini was at one of them. It's like none of them are that small anymore. And they now almost don't tick the box of what they were initially intended. And we're sort of starting to see with electric cars and stuff, some new designs come in for interesting small city cars that might have seats in front of each other or, you know, that sort of thing that might fulfill that role again. Um, I think it's sort of an interesting space, but yeah, I want to see more stuff that's essentially just for a person to get around town with not much else rather than everyone driving their SUVs with seven seats and two people in it. I, I, I get that massively. You know, there is, uh, particularly now with electric powertrains and um, everything associated with that, there is the opportunity to be revolutionary, if you want to, in terms mm. of how you would design something. Having said that, uh, and again, you're too young for this, but the Sinclair uh, C5 or whatever it was called, you know, the the three-wheeler thing that was invented, electric car. Oh, yeah. Um, that was marginally dangerous <laughs> on the base. <laughs> it was so small, it would get squashed a lot. 
And yeah. um, so you've got you you've got a balance, I think, between I think people have just got to reinvent the way we do things. I mean, COVID's been great for um, letting people see there's a different way of working. And yeah. um, uh, I don't know how many Zoom calls I've had. I've never had a Zoom call before <laughs> COVID. And I quite enjoy them, especially when I can put an interesting background on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, the, um, the, the same way that I quite like the new Hyundai and the uh, Kia, um, yes, six because they they haven't constrained themselves with uh, some of the design. Um, I think flaws that some of the other manufacturers have got. You know, they had a fresh look at it and decided yeah. there's another way to do this and let's do it that way. So yeah, there's um, there's some fascinating stuff to come out. I think in the future. Yeah, I think it's and and one thing we've seen is we've seen a lot of manufacturers come up that are coming at cars that have never made cars before. So they're not, like you said, they're not constrained by, if if you're, you know, VW group or something, you've made God knows how many millions of cars in your lifetime. You have a bit of a, this is how we make cars. Yeah. You know, this is what a car should be like. Whereas if you've, ne- if you've only made like, I don't know, some tech or something, and you go, let's make a car, you can start at the whole thing again and go, let's optimize this for, what we want a bit like coming back to the gt car thing like yeah. what's this car's purpose yeah. and let's design it around that and, and absolutely agree 100 percent with that and you know that's where i think the car design of the future has got to go it's got to become a different thing to the thing it is today but then we will live our life differently as well so you yes. know, that we will recognize that we have to stop for 20 minutes to charge it on a long journey um so what um you know, we set off 20 minutes earlier and we have a nice cup of coffee and we relax. And yeah. uh, I think that there will be... I, I fear that I won't live long enough to see the sort of ideas that uh, I think will come as a consequence mm. um, the revolution that we will ultimately have. But I know yeah. my grandson will live long enough and yeah. I'm yeah. pleased it's in that world. Yeah, it's... It's there's going to be. I think well, everyone. What's, what's the phrase? I can't remember. It's, it's they overestimate what's going to happen in a year's time, but underestimate what's going to happen in ten years' time, or you know that sort of thing. And it, it'll be crazy. Are we going to see an electric David Brown Mini? At um, some point? Not for the time being. We're always looking at things. I think that one of the issues there is that technology moves so very very quickly. Um, yeah, and the you know even battery size is coming down all the time. One of the one of the real issues with uh, the mini packaging as well. Clearly, there's not a lot of space. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, um, but again, properly defining um, what how the car would be used um, would massively influence um, how you might do that. Yeah, if you go, I don't need back seats and it's just luggage space or something, then you've got a lot more space and whatnot. I think, I think, I think you like you said, the tech is changing so much at the moment that you don't want to, you wouldn't want to say do something and be left behind a year later unless you can adapt it, you know, whether the power packs can, batteries can be swapped out or whatnot and stuff like that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think it's a, it's an interesting in space, but at the moment, yeah, driving, driving one of your minis you that engine is quite a big part of the experience and it's quite fun yeah it is i mean i love driving i love driving them all uh because i guess of the sporting background i've got myself in terms of uh mm. of cars then the uh, Selly edition is uh, a real bit of fun and uh uh and i love it i want one <laughs> yeah <laughs> Are you going to get one? Have you got one of your minis? I've got one of the. I've got the, one of the prototypes we made uh, yeah. right at the very beginning. Good, good times, good times. Right. Well, I normally wrap these up with five questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Do you have? We may have briefly covered this, but maybe not. Most memorable driving trip or journey? There is a route across the top of the Andes. 
Uh, and I can't remember the road, but you drive up so high that in an old car, it starts to run out of oxygen and you run out. Okay, yeah. And it's absolutely one of the most stunning places I've ever driven. It's where the flamingos uh, at night time. It gets so cold up there. At night time, the water freezes around their feet. And in the morning, they have to wait for the sun to come up so they can move again. Oh, wow. They're not very clever, those flamingos. But yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've got a ton of different places that I love. I love driving, love driving in Scotland, just like the, uh, the, whole, the whole thing. Yeah. When you were in the Andes, what were you driving? Were you driving your AC? AC, yeah. Uh, yes. I think I. whenever I hear of people doing amazing road trips, I, I, I've done a couple of fun ones, but I think there's so many, there's so many amazing ones that's out there. And I think a lot of people give excuses of I don't have the right car in the right place and the right whatever. And then you see someone like yourself taking an old car, going to a crazy place. And you're like, okay, you can take any car to these places. It'll be fun. It's the journey, isn't it? Oh, it's the yes. journey, yeah. And I'm a big believer in enjoying the journey and not just trying to get to the destination. Yeah. Okay, so if you were planning a road trip, how do you go about doing that time-wise? Do you just go, this is the distance or do you, how do you allocate the time? Because I think that's quite an interesting. Well, on, on the rallies I've talked about, the distance every day is determined because you're on okay, a rally yeah. by the hotels, basically, or the accommodation that's booked. So if you've got, like, peaking to Paris, maybe 250 people, uh, they've booked a hotel for one night. If you don't get there, you can't get there a day later. Um, yeah. On the journeys that I like to do, um, I don't want to have a destination um, determined by time. Um, yeah. You know, I'd rather just think, this is beautiful. I'm going to stop, smell the roses and not worry about. So if I'm, if I'm making my own plan, I like to have a plan. <laughs> and it's, I, I think, I've, I think everyone, this will resonate with everyone a little bit. Those times when you've, you've, you might be going on a trip somewhere or whatever and you come across somewhere, a place or something and you're like, I, I want another day at least here to go and do this cool thing or whatnot. You're like, no, but you've got to leave in at 9 a.m. tomorrow. You're like, no. And then you're never going to go back. Like, you're never going back to that place. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, I can picture a hundred of those places. <laughs> Uh, and I have probably never spent enough time anywhere, you know, you, because yeah. you, even though I say I'd like not to have a plan, ultimately I end up having a plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Life does catch up eventually. If you could, if you could only drive one car for the rest of your life, what would that be? And you're, and you're allowed something that costs 500 pounds on the side. I would make that decision based on being practical. So if I could only have one car, it would have to be an immensely practical thing. And um, so if if it was, I would have a speed back. Um, Fair enough. Because, but it couldn't be a car I made myself. It would be the new Defender. What do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? What should be worth more than it is? I happen to think that Jaguar um, is an undervalued brand in the sense that it produces some stunning cars, but it has a reputation today of being uh, an old man's choice of, of vehicle. And it shouldn't be. Yeah. You know, when, when I was a child, uh, my dad always drove Jaguars because they were the, the sporting cars the nation produced in quantity. And so yeah. I suspect that there's a lot of cars like that, but um, within that range, that mm. it, a different badge on would sell for more money or sell more of them. So, yeah, I'd answer it like that. I I, I agree, agree with you on that one, because up until the F-Type came out, I think for me, I didn't really look at Jaguar. I thought that XKR was kind of cool, but then when the F-Type F -type came out and we had all the V8s and the V6s and stuff, 
it, it suddenly became a lot more interesting. But I'd still look at the saloon cars and everything like that and be like, hmm, this is kind of, a, it's got an old person's image. But I think that is shifting over time with these the more as they're sort of they're competing a bit more and doing more stuff but yeah I, I think that's a good that's a good answer to that question do you what is the most interesting car to you at the moment um i think and it relates back to our uh, previous part of the conversation that is mm. that the i really like the platform that the hyundai and the kia um electric cars are now going to be based on yeah it, it seems to me to have thrown away a whole host of things that have been in our dna for the last 100 years of manufacturing and um, so i think that that potentially um is where i i think those companies will be the ones that drive uh the modern car forward not necessarily, and with due, with all due respect, the Mercedes Benz or the yeah. or the Audis of this world, etc. You know, it'll be it'll be someone that started almost with a, a clean sheet of paper. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. I think at the moment we're in this weird transition period of this this new tech coming in, and like if I was if I was to buy an electric car in a hypothetical five years time. I could very much see it being from not the people I would have conventionally bought a car from like Audi, Porsche or someone like that. I could see someone else like Hyundai or whatever coming in and just doing something so different with so much cool, so many cool features and just a different way of doing it that you're like, that's the obvious answer. Yeah, definitely. Um, right. Final question. Five car garage, unlimited value. What would I have? Mm. I'd have my AC. Yeah. Because I know every nut and bolt on that thing, having tightened it up across the world. Um, yeah. Absolutely, definitely. Um, I would have the speed back. Yeah. I would have one of our minis, a mini remaster. Yep. It would, the practical one would be, I, I've got a Range Rover. Uh, and yeah. I love that car because you can do anything you want to in it. So I think I'd have I think I'd have one of those, or mm -hmm. a new Defender. Um, how many have we got so far? Four. You've got four, so you've got one more slot. Right. Well, I'm not interested, as I've said earlier, in uh, some silly supercar. Um, yeah. So I I think that um, I would have the Hyundai. Oh. As uh, as representing the future, yeah, yeah, I get that. Have something electric in the garage. Yep, yeah. do something a bit different. I when someone asked me this question, uh, someone asked it back to me. I don't know a couple of weeks ago, and I was surprised at myself that I had I had in my five car garage a small electric car because I live in a city, and I was like, I I now having had one, would not not have one. Would not not have one. <laughs> yeah, I will always have a small electric car. I think whatever that looks like, I think from now on um, in my garage, even though it's as a petrol head, it, it doesn't necessarily fill an amazing slot, but I think it's an essential part of my garage from time going on now. Yeah, I think so too. And, um, you know, I like the, I, I do like new technology, but I also mm. like... And again, you know, the COVID uh, change to our lives have made you think about the, the world in a different way. And yeah. um, everything we can do to help that world, it will be with, um, you know, oil boilers uh, produce more smoke in Stuttgart, uh, more pollution in Stuttgart than cars do. Uh, yes. And... Um, uh, People have got a real downer on uh, on cars as being the cause of a lot of pollution, and it is that's because people have got a downer on cars sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. I think like in London, the stat on um, I think it's something like thirty percent of air pollution is from wood burning, like stoves and wood burners in people's lounges and stuff like that. 
Thirty percent. I think it's thirty percent. It's 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 a really really high number for something that you go like. I wasn't aware that people still. I've got friends that have them because they think they look nice. Yeah. But I wasn't aware that people were using them, and I think people are not aware of how bad they are for your health. But it's but but that is actually mainly people burning not dry wood. So um, okay. it, that is what produces, you know, it's damp wood that produces the pollution. I think they, they banned it, haven't they? Or they're just about to ban the wood with a, uh, a high moisture content. So um, yes, I th- you won't be able to burn that anymore. I think that's definitely part of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy that, that it, like you said, it's cars are a part of this, all of this bigger picture. And we have to look at all the, the bigger picture. Um, I've found doing, like you said, you've done a lot of a Zoom calls. I've switched the majority of my podcasts are now recorded over the air. And I try and meet up with people when I can, but most of them are over the air. And I, I, I realize how much time I've saved in traveling, which is absolutely insane. <laughs> well, it is. And at the end of the day, you know, we, 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 we all do something to earn money one way or the other. Mm. Um, but the one thing we're really going to run out of is time. And uh, yeah. that's almost why I never want to reach the destination when I go on a journey. I don't want to get <laughs> Yeah, it's over. It's over. Uh, so I think that is a, that is a great, great point to, to wrap up this, this podcast. Thank you very much for coming on. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure chatting. No, thank you too, Sam. I've enjoyed it. It's been great.